Welcome to The Quarantine Tapes, a daily podcast from Onassis, L.A. and Dublin. Hosted by Paul Holden Graber, this series chronicles shifting paradigms in the era of social distancing. Hello? Hello, could I please speak with Kiana Scott? Speaking. Hello, Kiana. This is Paul Holdengraber calling you from the quarantine tapes. I'm so, so pleased that you accepted to take our call and that you're part of the series. How are you today? I'm well. Thank you for asking. How are you? I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm, I'm, <laughs> it beats alternatives. I'm, I'm happy to be, to be speaking to you. Where do I find you at the present time? I am at home. And where is home? I know home is something uh, we, we, oh. will, we will talk, home is something you and I will talk about. So I'm curious where home is these days. Um, K Town, Los Angeles. And you you have an apartment there. Yes. And how long have you been there? A year. How are you spending this quarantine time? I am still working. I am considered an essential worker and I am homeschooling. And what what kind of essential work do you do? Um, I work for the Department of Children and Family Services. Tell me more about it. Tell us a little bit about you. Maybe you want to introduce who you are and um, what you've done and what you're doing at the present time. My name is Kiana. Um, I am a social justice advocate. I do a lot of public speaking and advocating for um, the rights of homeless or unhoused people and uh, foster youth. I am a former foster youth. I aged out of foster care at 18. Um, I've been in and out of the system since I was four years old. Um, so I spend a lot of time just doing education about the unknown foster care to homelessness pipeline that there is and how there is just the general negligence of foster youth as a whole um, and the like how people are unaware of how easy it is to transition from being in care to being on the street. I have also written a book. It came out in September of last year. I wrote a memoir. And I just recently ran for Congress in the 34th district in California. An amazingly, an amazingly rich life. And um, you, you, you spoke about something that I think is so important for us to discuss, which is a correlation between foster care and homelessness. Studies have shown that within a year of emancipation, patient, roughly a quarter of foster care youth will experience homelessness. Within four years, about half will be homeless. So if you could help us understand that correlation, since it's something you, you've experienced um, so deeply and it, from, from reading about it so painfully. So basically, in a traditional home, you have a child, they turn 18, they may or may not leave the home, they may go to college, but they have the option of choosing to stay or go. Uh, when you're in foster care, that option is not given to you. At either 18 and now, it's 21, sometimes 23, funding stops. And so when funding stops, your placement stops. Mm -hmm. And you're not given alternatives or the alternatives are, the resources for alternatives are so small and inefficient that the only viable option is a shelter or being on the street. And so a lot of times with social workers just having caseloads um, that are very high and just the emphasis instead of being put on quality care, just putting being put on numbers, um, social workers will close out cases 
without finding um, suitable long-term placement for these children. And so they'll end up in shelters, like 30 or 90 day shelters, and then they're on the streets after that. And then they're just scrambling, trying to figure it out. Like they go from high school to learning how to survive almost instantly. In you, you were mentioning your your memoir, Viewer Discretion Advised, which was published last September. Kim Fay writes, according to a study by the Harvard Medical School, the University of Michigan and Casey Family Programs, former foster children, are almost twice as likely to suffer from P. TSD as U.S. war veterans who fought in Iraq. Reading that, uh, Kiana, was tremendous. I mean, that statistic is terrifying. Yeah, I mean, I didn't get diagnosed with PTSD until I was 27. Um, I had been living with misdiagnosis my entire life. Um because I guess it wasn't really a thing when I was younger or it was just only associated with like soldiers and people in the military. It wasn't something that people thought, and this is just my assumption right. that um, could be widespread across, you know, I was like you could experience trauma outside of being in the military. And so, um, yeah, it's, I, like I said, I have chronic PTSD from just being in foster care from, being homeless and the things that happen when you're homeless and um, it's common. I don't know any foster youth or any former foster youth that doesn't have some form of PTSD because of their experiences. Because if you think about it, even if it's in the child's best interest, you're taking a child from their home and then placing them with strangers. And they're immediately supposed to assimilate into this new family environment. Um, with very little explanation of what's happening. And now all of a sudden where there was like a mom or a grandmother or an aunt and an uncle, however dysfunctional it may have been, now there are these new people and now there's social workers and now there's lawyers and you have to do all these checks and now there's these people that you don't know and you're just thrown in their home. You're, you, you're taken out of your school. You have to transfer. You're explaining, to, or even if you don't transfer, you're explaining to your friends or have, trying to figure out who this new person is that is picking you up from school or dropping you off or why you may have been picked up and dropped off before and now all of a sudden you're catching the bus. Like, there's so much that is not accounted for or thought about that a child experiences when they go into foster care. The whole thing is like, oh, we're making their lives better because we're putting them in a safer environment, but we're not accounting for the trauma of the transition. I mean, this letter you wrote, uh, Kiana, um, called um, Dear Nimby, my name is Kiana Kay, and I'm not welcome in your backyard, is so extraordinary. I'd like to read the last paragraph and then for you to comment a little bit on, on what prompted you to write it and really what, what kind of response and message uh, this has sent uh, to the community. You write at the end of this extraordinary letter, which I really encourage everybody to read, you dissect my life, scrutinizing the credibility of my story. You wear your bias like a badge of honor when you see my history. You judge me for having children, for needing assistance. You hate me for wanting the stability you take for granted. You force me to perform to prove my worth. Then you still deny me access to fair, affordable housing. And why? Because you didn't like looking the other way when you saw me on the street. Because you were repulsed by my tent. Because I was aesthetically unpleasing. Or is it simply because I have made you uncomfortable and your discomfort is enough to disqualify a person from the American dream? Tremendous. Tell us about that. Tell us about this, I'm not welcome in your backyard. Um, I've come to accept that my existence offends people. Um, the... The thought is, with foster youth, it goes one of two ways. 
you're either seen as a victim or you're seen as a delinquent. And um, there's no in between, or you're seen as a victim that has become a delinquent. Um, with media, the way foster youth are betrayed, it's always that they've done something. They're like this, they've ran away from home. You know, they're coming from this abusive environment. And so now all of a sudden they're abusive. We're, we don't see foster youth being educated. We don't see foster youth um, being successful in media. And so it kind of perpetuates this stereotype that's not often true. And so even in the letter, what I'm just saying is like, people meet me and I'm not what they expect. Right. Um, they're shocked when I tell them I was homeless for 10 years because they're like, oh, you're, you speak so well. I was like, what does me speaking well have to do with affordability of housing. I can speak well and still not be able to afford housing. Or if I tell them that I'm employed and I can't afford housing, they're like, that doesn't make sense. What do you mean you can't afford housing? You just have it. Like you just get a job. Like, yeah, I did that. And it didn't work. Um, it's a challenge. Like my existence and not just mine, but many people, like it challenges the norms of society because we're taught go to school, get a job, get an education, you'll be able to afford these things. Well, there's so many people who go to school, get the job, get the degree. Now they have to loan debt and they can't afford housing. They go to school, they have a baby, they have to drop out. Now they're working a minimum wage job and they can't afford housing. Like there's so many different things that happen and you challenge whenever these things happen and they're brought to people's attention, it challenges their biases that they may be aware or unaware of. And when you do that, it makes people, people who are unwilling to change, it makes them uncomfortable. And, um, when they're confronted with their own uncomfortability, there's, it goes one of two ways. They either acknowledge their ignorance and they're willing to change and help be a part of the solution, or they double down on it. And then they just act like you don't exist. And that's me saying I'm denied the American dream. Like, Oh, because the response more often than not is, well, it's not my fault that you did this. It's not my fault that you did that. And it's like, no, it may not be your fault, but you can also be a part of the solution to stop the cycle because I didn't choose to age out of foster care and be homeless. Right. I didn't choose to have to learn how to survive very early, very quickly. Like if you think about it, 18 is not mature enough to make life decisions. I had my first child at 19 years old. I was not as, mature enough to make those kind of decisions for myself. And yet I was put in a position where I had to. And Whereas if and, I would have they had... Didn't, and they didn't... Pre I mean, what is very important for listeners to know is that you may have been 18, but nothing had taught you even how to pay bills. Um, even that... Right. And I, I'd like you to, to, to tell listeners a little bit about that, about how, in, in, in effect, how maybe you were 18, but... Uh, foster care had not prepared you for what would happen afterwards. Right. So, I mean, we had, I took these classes when I was like maybe 15 or 16 and they taught you basic, like how to boil water cooking, how to open a bank account, um, how to apply for a job, how to dress for an interview. And then that was it. There was never a discussion about bills. There was never a discussion about credit. There was never a discussion about how to apply for an apartment, how to maintain an apartment, how to, or where to go to get furniture. None of this stuff was talked about. And then when I turned 18, I was all of a sudden expected to know all of this stuff. And I didn't. And so um, when I got my first apartment, my property manager actually had to help me turn on my utilities because I didn't know how. I thought you paid for an apartment and it came with it. And I also didn't know that you paid rent or bills every single month. So when I paid the first month, I thought that was it. And I was just able to stay there. And so subsequently I ended up getting evicted because I didn't manage my money. Well, I thought I had free money. I applied for credit cards thinking it was free money, not realizing that I would have to pay it back at the end of the month. Um, and learning just the hard way, these things that we don't, that I wasn't taught or that weren't really talked about in the home. And I think that um, at large, it's not really talked about at home. Like we hear it mentioned in homes, but it's not really talked about, I think, um, in communities of color, I should say, or lower, or lower income communities. Like when you hear bills talked about, it's always a stress about not having enough, but there's not um, a discussion about finances and credit and the importance of, 
maintaining good credit or maintaining a credit card balance of under 30% or the importance of paying your bills on time and um, properly budgeting and, and managing your money. These things just weren't discussed in foster care because you're not really seen as a member of the family. But then in lower income communities of color in general, they're not discussed. For you, reading is very important. Um, and I'd like you to say something about what, what, what books mattered to you. What books matter to you? And what did they offer you? What did they afford you? Um, when I was younger, I read everything. Anything I could get my hands on, I would read it. Um, my favorite books were the biography of Nelson Mandela, Malcolm X, and Roots. Um, so Roots was a, a way of escape for me, and it provided me with a hope that life could absolutely be terrible but there could be worse in it, maybe not for me, but for generations after me, that there could be some value in my life. Um, and it gave me hope. And that was at 13. And just reading about Malcolm X and, and Nelson Mandela, I kind of formed in myself this sense of justice and just doing what is right in spite of what it may cost. And always standing up for what is right and speaking truth to power, no matter what, because it's important. And it's whatever um, I may think or whatever I'm experiencing is not unique to me. And so it needs to be said so that it's, that there is a change that happens. Where, where are you, where and how are you finding community now? And I don't only mean, um, I don't only mean in this moment of the pandemic, but certain organizations may have helped you. Um, Alexandria House has been a huge part of my community building and formation of stability in the last three years. Also, my church. Um, they are um, essential for me. And just staying rooted and grounded in reality and not being lost in everything else that's happening, especially here recently with all of the things going on with the pandemic and just being isolated from the world. It's so easy to just be in fear and they help me to not be in fear, but just maintain a posture of gratefulness for the things that I do have, as opposed to focusing on what I don't have and just being mindful of my actions and interactions with people. Earlier on, you were saying that there are two ways of reacting uh, to your presence in the world. One is, in a, in a sense, to, to blame you and perhaps to look away in so doing. And the other is to be part of the solution. Now, this is a grand, great question, and I don't mean at all for you to say that you could offer a solution, but what might be some of the steps? Um, I think there are many things. Uh, the simplest one is voting. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, as, <laughs> I mean, as, as simple like as it sounds, right? Uh, 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 voting right. and not being dissuaded from doing so. Right. That is the simplest and <laughs> oftentimes the most important because yeah. the people that you elect have the ability to affect change and the people that you elect, you need to make sure that they have a willingness to listen to you and understand that they work for you and not the other way around and that they won't put um, corporate interests or personal gain above the interests and common good of people because it doesn't matter how loud the activist is. It doesn't matter how loud the neighborhood is. If you don't have the person in office who will listen to you, it's just a bunch of noise. 
you have to have the you have to have the activists, but then you also have to have the power behind them to be able to effectively turn the wheel to um, help make the change. So it's not just voting, but being informed about your vote and really just understanding who the person is that you're voting for and what they stand for um, beyond what they say. Because what I learned from my short time in politics is that people will say anything. Um, because it sounds good and it makes for a good soundbite or it's the popular opinion at this time, but their track record doesn't necessarily line up with what they're saying. So it's important to do your due diligence and it's extremely difficult. I found myself being extremely frustrated mm. um, in the process because I just realized that I, had I not been running, I would not have had, I would not have taken the time to do the research mm. and I just would have taken what people say for face value and I found myself asking the question all the time. I was like, how many people do this? Like, they just hear it and it sounds good and then they go with it because you're busy. Like, you're a parent and so you have homework or you're working two or three jobs. You're taking care of an aunt, a sick aunt or a sick parent. Like, there's so many, no one has time to do the research. And so politicians oftentimes take advantage of that and they just create the sound like that, that sounds or looks good or they create the visual that looks good because they know you don't have the time to do the research. But it's so important to know who you're voting for because they can be a part of the solution in affecting change. So that's the simplest and the most important thing, I think. And then also becoming an activist. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean being arrested or protesting and, and, uh, and boycotting. You can do your own form of activism, whether it's simply just sticking up for someone or making yourself more aware and educating the community around you, you can affect change on a small level that will eventually branch out to something bigger simply by spreading education in your immediate, uh, immediate community. Do you, now you have a home in Koreatown. Um, do you go and see uh, some of the, the homeless people you used to live um, next to? Um, I haven't been homeless on the street since I was 21, and that was in another state. So, no, I don't see any of the people that I was um, on the street with anymore. But before the pandemic, I would go to Alexandria House two or three times a week, um, sometimes to receive services, sometimes just because, or just to go to dinner and still just talk to the residents there and... Um, on Saturdays, we had a fitness class, and we would all work out together. Um, so I'd get up on Saturday mornings and go hang out. Like, I'm very much involved in my immediate community. Um, not so much on a bigger scale, just because it's harder for me to go and see it um, without being angry. Right. And upset and feel very helpless. So for my own mental health, I don't go. And that may be a little selfish, but I have to preserve myself for my child. Yeah, so, protect um, If I'm not well, she's yeah. not well. Yeah. How was it? How was it, Kiana, writing, writing that story, that story of extraordinary trauma? What was it like to, to articulate that, uh, that trauma through the written word? Um, at the time, I didn't give it much thought. I saw writing as a form of therapy for me to be able to express things and to talk about things that didn't, that I hadn't um, had the opportunity to talk about or to share. Um, a lot of things in my book, I never told anyone. And um, being able to just write and not have someone interject or ask questions or judge um, gave me the freedom to just be able to tell the truth and the whole truth. And so for me, in a way, it was very freeing. But then when the book was finished, I became very afraid because of how honest and unfiltered it is. I was worried about how I would be perceived by people, how they would judge or, you know, make assumptions about what they would have done and they were in my situation or in the different situations um, or circumstances that I talk about in the book. Um, I worried about like my daughter and what she would like, what the people around her would think, um, as far as like her teachers and things like that. Um, 
So initially it was great. After the fact, it was not so much. I, I kind of went into a little bit of a panic and had to stay off of social media for a little bit. And now I'm just in a place of my mind being made up like and owning every experience and knowing that there's hope in all of it. So yes, that may have been, it was traumatizing. It was horrible. Yes, I did live through all of those things, but the important thing is I lived through it and um, I'm better for it and I'm able to help people because of that because there are a lot of people who won't be able to share their story or won't have the strength to articulate it in any form. And so if they can identify with what I talk about in the book and then even just see me now, I hope that it can provide hope for them that it will get better and that things do eventually change. Do you have such hopes that things will change in some way, perhaps for the better, as an outcome of this horrendous pandemic? Um, yes, I would like to hope so. I mean... <laughs> yeah, um, we all would. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. I, just, I, I, I ask that question with some... Well, some hesitation in some way. Yeah, I think that... So a lot of times when I go and talk to people about homelessness and I'm like, most people are a paycheck away or most people are one circumstance away from being on the brink of homelessness and they just aren't aware of it. Or, you know, it can happen to literally anyone. A lot of times people are so far removed that they don't see it. And so um, in this instance, there are people who are experiencing the threat of homelessness who would have never Like, it would have never gotten to them. Um, who are experiencing food insecurity for the first time. Who are experiencing the fear of not being able to pay rent or your mortgage or um, be able to afford the lifestyle that they had through pandemic. And so yeah. my hope is that it awakens a new level of empathy in people. Um, and it just makes them more aware of how fragile we as people are. Well, and that there really is no, in, there's no security in life because look, a pandemic, something that is out of our control took away everything. Life as we know it, there will, there's going to be a new normal after this and nobody could have, well, I mean, there were people that predicted it, but no one could have prepared for it. You know, it, 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 remind, it reminds me, Kiana, of a, of a, a verse of the Bible. You so love one of the pro proverbs where, um, It is said, those who shut their ears to the cries of the poor will be ignored in their own time of need. And how deeply that applies to the, the present moment as you just articulated it. Yes, that is, um, so I have scriptures written throughout my house of just different things that I want to remind myself. And that is one of them to just remember no matter where I am in life, the moment I stop listening, the moment that my heart isn't affected by the disenfranchisement of others is the moment that I am one, no longer effective. Two, I should probably stop doing whatever it is that I'm doing. And then three, in my moment of need, I will not be heard. Well, you have been heard here and it's been really extraordinary to talk to you. Kiana Scott, I really, I really thank you very much for taking the time, and I hope that when um, this pandemic is over, whatever that might mean, we will be able to to meet each other. And for the moment, I send you a big virtual hug. Thank you. This was fun. Oh, well, that's I good. Work... That's good. I'm glad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's. I'm. So I'm I... glad. Did you not expect it to be fun? I didn't know what to expect. Neither did I. Like, Neither did <laughs> I. <laughs> and here we are. And um, take good yeah. care. Take good care of yourself and 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 your child. And um, all the best to you. I send you really my my warm appreciation. Be well. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me and for taking the time to just have this conversation. I appreciate it. I do too. All the best to you. Bye bye. You too. Bye. To support this show and Dublab's progressive programming, go to dublab.com/support.